started with our final presentation for the afternoon. So we're going to invite uh, Carolyn Loeb up from here from the University of Vermont. And she's going to be presenting on bringing Vermont conservation design to private landowners in the Vermont uh, Coverts Cooperator Network. Strategies, challenges, and areas of opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, and thank you all for being here today. I'm really excited to talk about this project because it was just so cool. Um, so to give you a little bit of background, I'm a graduate student here in the Field Naturalist Program at the University of Vermont. And this summer, I had the great pleasure of working for Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department and Vermont Cupboards to bring this amazing design, Vermont <coughs> Conservation Design, to private landowners in the Cupboards Cooperator Network. And I'd like to talk to you generally about that for the next 15 minutes. And I hope that by the end of this presentation, I can convince you of two major things. The first is that landowners get this. They understand Vermont conservation design. And the second is that we can use Vermont conservation design to generate excitement and also to generate action on behalf of private landowners, which I think is definitely in keeping with the theme of this session. Um, so those are my major goals, but before I get too deep in the weeds because I get so excited about this, I want to back up and I want to start by telling you a story about what it was actually like to go out there and work with landowners this summer. And so for my story, I'd like to take you to Danville, Vermont to meet this lady. <laughs> this is Janet, and Janet was one of the 12 coverage cooperators that I had the pleasure of working with this summer. And because Janet is a coverts cooperator, what that means is that she attended a three-day, really cool, intensive training on keeping her private land, all 30 acres of it, healthy for wildlife and also to maintain good ecosystem function. And when Janet left the training, she was piled up with books about wildlife and land conservation and loaded with professional references. And then like many landowners, she had all this amazing information and she went home and her next question was, now what? Where do I start and what do I do with this? And that's where I came in, uh, because we offered a free service to landowners, and my job was two parts. The first part was to introduce Vermont Conservation Design to landowners in the coverage network who applied for a visit. And the second part was to go out and walk properties with people like Janet and to do ecological surveying. So because this is 15 minutes, I'm just going to talk about part one today, but if you're interested in part two, please hunt me down after this presentation. So on a fine July morning, I drove to Janet's house in Danville, Vermont, I knocked on her door, and she invited me in. And the first thing that happened is I was besieged by family members. I met Janet's two sons who were visiting. I met her four grandchildren who were all barefoot and chasing her chickens around the yard. <laughs> and I met Janet's husband, Woody, who likes to timber for firewood on their property. And for the first 20 minutes, we didn't talk about conservation at all. Not the design, not anything except how's the weather, how's life, wow, what a beautiful place. Gosh, it's a hot day already, and it's only 8 a.m. Uh, and Janet invited me to sit down for a cup of tea. That's when I made my entrance. I pulled out Vermont Conservation Design maps of Janet's property. And unfortunately, in 15 minutes, I don't have a lot of time to tell you about the design, although if you heard Bob Zano's talk earlier, or if you've heard uh, talks on BCD before, you probably know what I mean to this. But if you don't, I would encourage you to find out. This is an amazing design, and it has the support of a lot of incredible people in the state of Vermont already. Um, but in Janet's case, my job wasn't just to tell her about the design, which I was doing, but to really show her why it mattered to her. And so I made her a series of three maps, and we're going to look at two of them today. This is the first map that I made for Janet, and as I said, Janet owns 30 acres, and the outlines of Janet's property are kind of hash marks here on this map. And without even really talking about the design, what might pop out to you right away is that Janet's property is along this road, and she exists in this big green blob. And so when I took out this map, she was like, what is that big green blob? <laughs> and it turns out that big green blob is an interior forest block, which um, Bob Zeno also touched on in his talk. And so we know that in Vermont, many of our forest species, everything from black bears to bobcats, to little things that I love, like hermit thrushes and oven birds, really need big chunks of forest to survive. And when I showed this map to Janet, she was like, oh yeah, I know that. I walked my land. I'm clearly in a forest, and we see black bear. We see lots of different wildlife. So it makes a lot of sense that we're in a forest block. So we were sort of reframing something that she already knew, and I found, I found that was true with a lot of landowners for much of my summer. Now, I also showed Janet a regional map of her property. I'm not going to show you that today because I get excited, and then I'll go over time. 
So I'm going to skip right to the state level map that I pulled out. And this was the last map I showed Janet. And before I talk too much about Janet's property in particular, all I want to say about this map is that if you haven't seen it before, one of the cool things about it is if you kind of blur your eyes, you can start to see patterns on the map. And in particular, the pattern that I often see is that we have this large network of green areas, and those are our big interior forest blocks, that create this kind of highway across the state of Vermont for the movement of animals and maybe under climate change plants as well. And so when I was presenting this design to Janet, I was like, you know what, Janet? The real question is, where is your property, your tiny 30 acres, even though it's beautiful, where are you in the state of Vermont, and what does that mean? And in Janet's case, if I can use a highway metaphor, uh, Janet is kind of like the 8991 interstate crossover point, right? So if you look at the spine of the Green Mountains, you can see that this would be a natural path for animals to use as they travel through the state all the way up to Canada, perhaps down into uh, western Massachusetts and southeastern New York State. Um, and you can also see that there's this eastern route that connects over to New Hampshire. And so when looking at Janet's land with her, we started to talk about what would it mean if not just you, but everyone in your neighborhood developed your land in a way that made it difficult for animals to cross. It would be kind of like the equivalent of a traffic jam on that one, where animals would get to that point and they would hit a roadblock because most of our forest animals don't like traveling without cover. And so they would have to turn around and go back the way they came or seek some sort of alternate route. So Janet and I had about 30 minutes to talk through these maps and to talk about the basic concept of Vermont conservation design over a cup of tea. And at the end of looking at these maps, there are two things Janet said to me that really jumped out at me and I was like, yes. First thing was that she pulled this map back out. And she said, well, Carolyn, that settles it. We're not going to build a house up there. And she was referring to the extreme northern part of her property, which had a great view. And her sons were considering moving home, and they were thinking about building a house. And she said, we can still build a house, but I don't want to fragment the forest. And so Janet and I started to talk about, well, where could you build a house that would be ecologically a good decision and could also accommodate all of these other needs that you and your sons have? And so we talked specifically about maybe the two best places on her property from the BCD perspective would be either in this tan area, which is where Janet's existing house is, which is why it's not a green forest block area, or along the existing road, so she wouldn't have to pave another road into that forest. That was the first thing that jumped out at me. And the second thing that jumped out at me was that about two weeks later, I got this really fun email from Janet, because she's a really fun woman. And her email said, hey, Carolyn, we had a great time. I'm so glad you came out. By the way, I'm going to have a party with my neighbors, and I want to show them the BCD maps that you gave me. You want to come back to Danville? <laughs> Which is about the coolest thing the landowner can email you about after you've left for a project like mine. And I was just like, oh, this is great. Um, so to me, those were two really big hits for a project that was designed to get people excited about their property, to show them how it was relevant to this bigger picture, and then to help them to take action. And so, at this point, you're probably like, okay, Carolyn, this is a good story, but Janet sounds like a pretty special lady. You know, is this a thing, or is this just Janet? <laughs> and that's a fair question, because Janet is a special lady. And I would argue that every coverage cooperator that I worked with this summer was special in some way or another. Um, so we did. We sent out an anonymous evaluation at the end of the summer, basically trying to figure out, okay, is it just you? or do people, generally speaking, seem to like this? We sent it to all 12 landowners in the Covered Cooperator Network that I work with, and amazingly enough, 10 of them responded, which I think says something in and of itself. And here's what they said. First, we wanted to know, does this make sense to people? Because it's really hard to pitch an idea to someone if they don't understand the, the basic idea of it. And amazingly, all 10 people who took the evaluation said, yeah, we get it. We understand what this design is and why you're trying to implement it. And that was pretty cool. We also wanted to know, OK, you said you got this, which is awesome. Are you actually going to do anything with it? Because you can like an idea. And if you don't actually take action, does it really matter? And so we also asked them, what are you going to do in the long term? Do these maps affect your understanding of how you will manage your property? And half of the folks that we surveyed anonymously said that in the long term, so more than five years into the future, they were very likely to modify their management plans as a result of seeing just these non conservation sign maps of the property. And the other half said they were either slightly or moderately likely to do so, which is, I think, kind of an astounding first result. 
right? And unfortunately, my master's program doesn't run for 10 years, so I can't actually go back and survey these folks in 10 years. But we did ask them to list other management activities that they were going to change on their property as a result of the service. And many people listed tangible things that they had already done or were going to do. So you have to be a little bit of a believer because you can promise a lot and not deliver. But I think after working with these folks this summer and seeing some of the things they said they would do in concrete terms, I'm a believer. Okay, so now you're like, okay, Carolyn Coverts is a very wildlife-centric organization. Of course, these are the folks in the state of Vermont that would be interested in doing something if you offered it to them. But what I would argue is that a lot of landowners in Vermont are interested in doing something like this. And so, what are we going to do next? And I would say, to me, what we did this summer was a huge success. And so it's time to use our superpowers for good. <laughs> and to take this project to a much larger network. And indeed, if you've seen those BCD maps, you know that there's a lot of land in the state that is probably not owned by coverage cooperators that is really, really important. And so, I'm going to tell you about some of the strategies I used this summer to bring the design to landowners. And I recognize that if you're working with a different network, your strategies might be different. But I think these are great places to start. One of the biggest challenges for me this summer, and one of the best ways in which I could do work, was really to be a counselor. And what do I actually mean by that? It's going to sound corny, but you need to have teeth. You need to watch their, grand, but their grandchildren run around barefoot, chase the chickens, laugh and enjoy it. Because ultimately, only half of what you're there for is the design. The other half is to become a trustworthy source so that if people start to get interested, they trust the information you're giving them. The second thing is keep it simple. I got really excited about all these little things that I could put on a map for people, and pretty soon my map had like 30 colors and 25 different types of lines, and people's eyes would just glaze over if I did that. And so instead, I just say, hey, you're in a forest block. That is the most important information I can give you. Let's keep it simple. And I think that really helped. The third thing, and I don't mean to say this at the, the downfall of technology, because I think technology is amazing. Um, but I think for me, it really worked to use paper. And here's the reason. When I brought these three maps to Janet, she could write on them, she could mark them up, she could circle areas on her property she wanted to know more about. And then when I left, those three paper maps were the maps she showed to her neighbors. A lot of people don't have a great color printer or they don't have a great internet connection. And so even if they're technology savvy, technology, it creates some barriers to, to showing and spreading the word about this. I love this. If you've ever ordered anything from Amazon and the thing that you wanted was $2, you're like, oh, I don't want to pay shipping on a $2 item. You make, you make it an add-on, right? You add something to it. And I think this is true for Vermont Conservation Design. This took me 30 minutes to talk to people about. I could personalize it for them. And in 30 minutes, they got it which isn't really surprising since a lot of Vermont landowners love their land. So I would argue if we are going to make the trip to do something in person, have tea with people, let's add it on. If you're there for some other reason, anyone who's working with landowners, or even not landowners, anyone who's interested in the future of Vermont, can add on something like this to their visit. And then finally, I want to mention thinking about strategies to reach people. And this is sort of a tough one because you have to really think about the target audience. And for me, it took a while to shift into that mode. But what I mean by this is that when I went out to see Janet, the best thing I could possibly do was to look at Janet's property and her vision through her eyes and to say, what are the things that Janet wants out of her land? And if I were Janet, how could I help her get interested in Vermont conservation design and what it could offer her? Because if I go in as me and I get all excited about vernal pools, but that's not Janet's thing, ultimately, Janet's not going to care. And so becoming the person that you're going to see and seeing the world through their eyes was one of the most important things I did this summer. So you may have heard this statistic before, but um, I think that this stuff really matters. And I would argue it matters to everyone in this room, even if you're still kind of processing this, because as you may have heard today, 80% of Vermont is privately owned. And of that 80%, two thirds is owned by people like Janet. So if we care about the future of Vermont, we need to care about people like Janet. Thank you so much.
rounds of outreach? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think this was a pilot program, which you probably already got the sense of from my presentation. Um, but it was really designed to start to say, you know, working with a group of landowners that we think might be receptive, what tools are helpful, and then from there, where do we go? And so I'm currently in the middle of writing up a report about this for Fish and Wildlife Department and for Vermont Covers. And I think they have a lot of different ideas, but I, I can't speak to them because I'm technically not a representative of either organization. So anyone, I know there are a few Fish and Wildlife folks and Covers folks in the room, so if anyone's comfortable sharing, feel free to do so. Uh, I'm all in favor of anything that reduces development. The very big devil's advocate for a moment. Um, what is the nature of a road or a driveway that fragments a forest? Is it the presence of the road, or is it the material of, which, of what it's built? Whether or not the forest is right to the edge of the road, or whether it's a lot of space on each side, and the amount of traffic. For yeah. example, it's the driveway, private driveway, retired, you can sell and drive down it. Is that almost negligible compared to a paved road with a lot of traffic all the time? Yeah, sure. It's a great question. I would say that you're definitely right that something that's a backwoods gravel road does not have nearly the impact that a front country paved you know, major road has. And I think one of the main arguments for reducing the number of roads into our forest is that they become points for country development. And so a, a gravel road today becomes a point at which someone is likely to subdivide along in the future. And once that's subdivided, it's likely to be paved. And so it's sort of, it's a question of what is the entry point? And I would say, you know, if a gravel road is always a gravel road, it's probably not a huge deal. But the question is whether it's likely to remain so. Yes. How do we get this information? How do you persuade planning commissions to incorporate this as they are supposed to in the final plans? Yeah, that's a great question. So Fish and Wildlife actually has someone, uh, Jens Hilke, right, whose job it is in part to bring this to conservation commissions. Um, so because my project was specifically designed to talk to landowners, I can't speak to that per personally, but I know that he's a pretty fabulous person, and the chances are he does a really good job. But I don't know if anyone who knows Jens and works for Fish and Wildlife wants to add into that comment. He's very okay. He's very <laughs> He knows how to work his plan. Maybe I should have time for one more question. Yes. So a um, lot of optimism with folks with in Vermont coverts, a lot of optimism for changing management plans. Mm -hmm. Here's if you thought or heard of any potential barriers from those folks who are moderately likely to change management plans. What do you think would be in their way as a barrier to to do action or change your management plans? Do you come up with hear any of those? Yeah, I think, and this is probably not the only thing, but it is the thing that jumps out to me, and that is uncertainty. I think most of the landowners I work with really genuinely love their land, and a lot of them refer to it as like their secret child. And then we go out and I feel like I'm showing you my secret child, and you come out the back door. Um, but a lot of them are older. A lot of them have children who may not know whether they're interested in inheriting this land. A lot of them are very fair-minded, and they're like, well, if I have four children, what do I do? Do I subdivide the land? Do I sell half of it and leave the two kids who don't want it the money and the other two kids the land? Um, and so I think the uncertainty of knowing economically and knowing logistically what's going to happen to your land if you're already in your 60s or 70s is one of the long-term impediments to this kind of thing. And I think it's actually maybe an argument as to why these matter because um, Janet's sons were, were there the day of my visit and I got to show them the Vermont Conservation Design Maps too. And I think it's really informative for folks who are considering passing on their land to understand the value of that land, and maybe if they have to subdivide it, to figure out what areas they're most likely to develop if they're going to consider the ecology of the land. So that's kind of along the way. Can I flip that question sure. to, for those who suggested they were going to change their management plans, could you give just one quick example of what that change might be like? Was Janet going to get her management plan changed, and what, um, what would that change yeah, specifically I think, be? Yeah, I think in Janet's case, it was choosing not to build a house in that interior force block. So that was just Janet's instance. Uh, I think, you know, 
the, the ways in which people are going to modify their management in the future were really diverse, but um, you'll notice that all of them had in common that it was long-term plans, not short-term plans. So the things that people are not doing once they see these the maps of their property, they're not deciding how to manage invasive species or which trees to cut. Those are very fine-scale questions for them. I think the questions that really are coming up for folks in the long term are like, what do I sell if I have to sell? Where do I build houses if I'm going to build another house? Um, and ultimately, what is the value of this land to me now that I understand maybe even a little more about its context? So that's pretty general, but I think those are the kinds of questions people are using for. Carol, could you share how many ESTAs you identified and how many people are looking at enrolling your ESTAs? Oh, sure. Um, so I'll just briefly mention, so the second part of my job was to do an ecological survey for landowners, and part of that survey was to look for sensitive natural communities, things like wetlands and vernal pools that either the landowner knew about, they didn't know what, what to do, or they didn't know about it. And so over the course of the summer with 12 landowners, I identified, so it was about 15 significant and sensitive places, including a couple of rare plants, and then um, four or five deer wintering areas that were listed previously but not in their current form. So that was an example of the second part of the project. And I think that's also um, an example of Vermont conservation design. I really focus in on the course features, like the big course blocks, but there's a whole scale of the design that deals with fine filters, and my job is really to help landowners identify those fine filters and their features on the landscape as well. So some of those landowners who have bought the course management plan too? Yeah, and actually, I'll say this really quickly because we're out of time, but we asked a question, in the eight weeks between the evaluation and when you received the visit from me, um, how many of you have actually done something in those eight weeks? And 50% of the people who responded, so five out of the 10, said they'd already done stuff. And mostly it was in basic species management because of the time of year, but the, the answers were really diverse, everything from rewriting trails to water bar installation, um, to protecting wetlands from timbering except in winter or maybe no timbering at all. So, so we'll pause there. It is a coffee break right after this, so you can continue to ask some more questions if you like. But we'll give another round of applause. So.